When Z-Man Games announced Pandemic Legacy in 2014, the concept seemed like an ideal pairing of Matt Leacock's cooperative game Pandemic, a title that had won over tens of thousands of fans and inspired many cooperative game designs from other people, with the one-way narrative structure of Rob Davio's Risk Legacy, which had taken a familiar game and transformed it in a radical way to make it an experience unlike any other because you would customize the game while you played it. The pairing of those two seemed like it would promise incredible things, and when Pandemic Legacy Season 1 was released near the end of 2015, yes, that promise was delivered upon. Woo! It was fantastic. I'd even played a quarter of the game at a preview event with Rob Davio, so I had a taste of what was coming, but once you're playing the actual game, where you go in ahead of time knowing that you are going to play a 12 to 24 game campaign, well, naturally you're going to choose people who you really want to play games with because you want to keep the same people the entire time and you were already primed to have a fantastic experience because you're playing with people you like. And then the pandemic legacy, legacy structure on top of that just made it even better. It's one of the best gaming experiences that I've ever had. It was fantastic and I think of it fondly even though I have not revisited the game since and actually I still have not played Pandemic Legacy Season 2. That's just how things happen sometimes. So Season 2 took the experience further, jumping ahead in the future. It's a different concept. Now Z-Man Games with Matt Leacock and Rob Davio have come out with Pandemic Legacy Season 0. Yes, this is a trilogy but as you might guess by the zero, this takes place actually before Pandemic Legacy Season 1. You can look at the cover setting here, you might get an idea what you're looking at somewhere in the Cold War. I'm going to talk about the game. I'm not going to spoil anything, and that's partly because they have taken a fantastic idea this time. I don't know, maybe this already existed in Season 2, but again, I have not seen that yet for various reasons. But this game has the same structure as Pandemic Legacy Season 1, in that you're going to play a year's campaign, January through December in the year 1962. And you are going to play each month at most twice, so you're going to play a 12 to 24 month campaign, just like in the original game. However, this has a prologue game that comes before it, and you can play this prologue game as many times as you want. And you will probably want to play it at least once because the structure of this game is very different from the original. And it takes a little while to wrap your head around what you're trying to do and how you're going to do things within the familiar pandemic structure of gameplay. I'm going to talk about the prologue. I'm not going to reveal anything from the year campaign itself. If you want to know nothing more about the game, if you want to be have this be a total surprise to you, then naturally you should not have clicked on this video to begin with. But I'm going to talk only about the prologue, which does not involve any of the permanent changes. It's just going to talk about the setup for the prologue itself and for the beginning of the campaign. And then at that point, I say nothing more and leave it to you to experience on your own. Here's the game board for Pandemic Legacy Season Zero, partially set up for the prologue game. The year is 1962. You start in Washington as agents on an allied team that is investigating a Soviet campaign called Project Medusa. The board starts with one safe house in Washington. You can establish other safe houses as the game progresses. You have a number of Soviet agents that start on the board in the familiar pandemic method. You turn over three city cards, place three agents in those cities, then two agents, one agent, and there you are set up. Each location is part of a region. There are six different regions that are listed on the board here with a number of locations in each of the regions. Each location is also part of an affiliation, either the allies or the Soviets or neutral parties. They do not want to get involved. So each location has those indications, either color coded or with these symbols. Each location also possibly has some eyes on it showing you are under surveillance. If you start the turn in that city, there's a drawback to doing so. Although sometimes you just might have to. Your goal in the prologue is to find Agent Sabik, who's an agent who initially worked for you and then went missing in the Soviet Union. You don't exactly know what happened, but you do know He's in Novosibirsk. You must get a team there, a specifically a Soviet team, to Novosibirsk. That Soviet team is going to be working for you, but if they get there, then you have completed this objective. Additionally, 
you must retrieve a sample of Project Medusa that is somewhere in Europe. You don't know where initially. You're going to start by taking all the Europe cards, shuffling them, and putting one of those cards under that objective. So that card is out of play, and you don't know where you need to go. You need to get a team to one of these locations in Europe in order to retrieve that sample. So you shuffle the cards into the deck. It adds a deduction element that seems like something new. I have not played all of the pandemic variations but this is definitely a new element to me. Each player, let's say we have a two player game, is going to get four starting cards like normal. You divide the deck up into fifths, and then each fifth gets an escalation card in it in a familiar manner. I'm gonna run through this quickly. I'm not gonna play a full game by any means, so we'll just pretend I shuffled all these. Shuffle the top ones, put this here. All cards are face up. I cover up some information here. I killed the agents in Toronto. We got other face up cards down here. I turned up one face up Europe card, that is London. So I know that London is not where the Medusa sample is, and I can mark that on the board. Okay. We have a certain number of cards to start with. For the prologue, you are going to tape, take a temporary alias. You are not going to be an official agent yet. You have very familiar powers that players are going to get, and those will affect you in various ways as you proceed into the game. Once you start the actual campaign, you put aside the temporary aliases, at least initially, you might need them again, and instead you get a passbook that has your real aliases which is a weird thing to think about, but yes, your real aliases for the game. You have a layout of the months at the beginning, but inside you are going to have a space for specifically your allied alias. You have a sheet of stickers. You have eight people on there with three copies of each person, and you're going to put a sticker of each person on each of the three pages in the book for my allied alias, my neutral alias, and my Soviet alias. I went with the red hair for the Soviet al alias, along with the big scarf. Seemed good for that environment. So you're going to write a name, and specifically you are going to have a particular skill or asset to begin with. You have lots of sticker sheets so you can customize what you're doing. Uh, bad things can happen to you over the course of the game, and then you can burn out an alias if your cover is blown. Each of these aliases has a number of cover spaces at the bottom here, and these are scratch-off spaces. If you are under surveillance over the course of the game, if you start a turn in one of those cities that has surveillance, you have to scratch off the leftmost space, and then you keep scratching on the board, and certain things might be revealed as you scratch them off, and eventually your alias might be burned. You have just blown your cover completely because you've been out there so often, and people are watching you, and they know this alias, and whoop, it's just out of play. You can gain liabilities, you can gain other assets as the game progresses. If one alias gets burned out completely, you can flip to another, or you can choose one depending on whatever this current situation is in the game. I have not played the campaign yet, so I cannot spoil anything about it since I know nothing about it. But as an overview of how you're going to use the aliases, you might have bad things happen to one alias, but not another, and you can choose different ones as the game progresses. If all the aliases are burned through, you can no longer use that character again. So you'll have to use another one, unless you're in a four-player game. And if a four-player game, you have to go back to one of the temporary aliases, which is a little generic. But I guess that's what you've earned at that point. I've assigned aliases to the two players, and now the prologue game is set up and ready to play. At the start of your turn, you see whether you're under surveillance. If you are, you would scratch off one of the cover spaces. If you have only temporary aliases, though, you lose a card from your hand for each unit of surveillance that you're under. So don't hang out in Moscow. You then take four actions from the list of actions available to you, many of which are familiar from other pandemics, many of which are unique to this setup. You can travel to an adjacent space, you can remove an agent from the board. That's two of my actions. The flight action works differently. You have two types of flights, a commercial flight and an unrecorded flight. 
With a commercial flight, if you were traveling to an allied location, and let's say I'm going to travel to London, I reveal the card. London, yes, it's part of our, our network. I fly to London and I do not discard the card. If I'm traveling to a neutral location, if I went to Sao Paulo, I have to reveal that card and then discard it to travel to Sao Paulo. Okay, I cannot fly to Pyongyang directly because it is under Soviet influence. However, if I am in a city and I have that card, I can discard that card to go anywhere because I'm already there and I'm getting out in an unrecorded flight. So my third action, I fly to London. My fourth action, I'm going to build a safe house where I discard the card and put up a safe house in London, which is fairly close to Washington, but there's a specific reason why you want to establish a safe house within a particular region, depending on the objectives that you have available to you. At the end of my turn, I draw two cards. I flip over two of these, Pyongyang and Sydney. And Sydney's covered up down here. And now the next player goes. So we're going to take turns, other actions available to you that are unique to this setup and what you're trying to do. You can share information that works similar to other pandemics. If you're in the same city, you can exchange that city card. One of the temporary aliases allows the player to give any card away. Okay, that's very familiar. If you are in a safe house, you can discard five cards of the same affiliation as the location of that safe house. So if this character we're in Washington with five allied cards in hand, they could discard those five allied cards and put an allied team in that location. Now, there are allied teams and neutral teams and Soviet teams. These are all teams of agents that you have hired that are going to work for you separately from you while you move across the board. One action that you can do on a turn is to move a team. So if this player had set up a team in Washington on a turn they can move this team to another location and at the end of your turn during the mop-up phase if you have a team that is active in the location that matches the identity of that team then it just removes any agents that are there they just go away that team of that team works for you to clean up the mess wipe out that red menace. If an allied team were instead in Warsaw, you flip it on its side and it doesn't do anything there. You can move it there, but it does not remove the agents. Why you'd want a safe house in Europe, even though it's very close here, is because of the action identify target city. I don't know where the sample is in Europe, but if I go to London and I discard three Europe cards from my hand, I can reveal this card. I can identify that target city. However, I've just discarded three cards, which means I don't have them available to set up teams. You will need teams because we need to, at some point, travel to a Soviet affiliated location, set up a safe house in that Soviet affiliated location, set up a Soviet team there, and then move that team to on here to Novosibirsk and once I do that I have now achieved this objective and can mark it. I need a Soviet team because it is a Soviet location and a neutral team or an allied team cannot be active at that location. I must set up in a Soviet a safe house in a Soviet location in order to create a Soviet team because I have to discard five Soviet cards at a Soviet location. At a safe house in a Soviet location. There we go bit of hoop jumping to get through. So like curing the disease, but instead you're going to set up a team that is then going to go out and do other things. You want neutral teams and allied teams and Soviet teams because you are going to try to neutralize all of these threats over the course of the game. If you would get an escalation, maybe you're right here. Oh, I have a very good first turn, possibly by not shuffling the deck well. If you have an escalation, it works similarly to an epidemic where you raise the threat level, you reveal a card from the bottom, you add three agents to that location, and then you shuffle the cards and put them back on top and reveal that many cards. If you would reveal a card that matches 
where you have three agents, you don't have an agent outbreak as in pandemic. I do not put agents in Paris and Prague and Warsaw. Instead, we have an incident. We mark this incident marker here. We have seven markers. If you would have to place an eighth marker, you lose the game. When you have an incident, you pull the bottom card off the deck and you read the text and carry out whatever is listed on there. And that card is now out of play in this game end area. So in this case, place an agent in every city with one or more incident tokens in North America. Does nothing right now. Okay. Sometimes those can be devastating because if it said place an agent where there's an incident marker in Europe, you would immediately activate this again and then draw another card and do that. So you can double up on the incidents. If you would have multiple outbreaks, if you had, for example, another incident marker here, you would not have two incidents happening at once if we were in this type of situation. If I reveal this card and put an agent in each of these, I'd only have one more incident even though I would mark both of these. That's terrible. That's a way to lose quickly. So I need a Soviet team to get to Novosibirsk. I don't know where I need to go right now in Europe. Europe has a neutral location as well as allied and Soviet locations. When I am trying to achieve this objective, I can just take a guess. I can, let's say I, I end up with a Soviet team in Warsaw and an allied team in Rome and another Soviet team in Kiev. And I've already determined that, let's see, Moscow and Leningrad and Istanbul are not where this card is. If I put teams here and I reveal this card and I'm correct, whoops, because that's Istanbul, which I had already marked. If that's not correct, then I've just lost the game because I thought I had a team where I, they needed to be and instead it did not happen. So you gain more information as you go through the deck, but of course you don't know when you're going to get the Europe cards. You can mark them off as you see them or you collect them and discard them at a safe house in that location and then you can find out that information directly, but I would still need to get an allied team to Istanbul and then take the achieve, uh, acquire target action in order to achieve this objective. Whew. There's a lot going on just in the prologue. With the aliases, they give you different powers. This alias lets you move another player or a team up to three cities away. They don't travel through those cities. You just say, yep, I'm gonna go to Karachi. This player is gonna be like, yep, I'm gonna take you to Karachi. There you go. Get you closer to clearing out these areas over here. Additionally, you can move a team up to three spaces away. If we had a neutral team on the board, you might move it, leave it over here so it can clean up Bombay at the end of your turn. This alias lets you put a team on the board for one card less. So just like carrying a disease, instead of needing five cards, you only need four. Now you can put out a team for one card less. The other aliases, you can put a safe house down without having to discard a city card. Normally you have to discard that card to do that. Or as an action, if you're in a location with a safe house, you can discard any card to go anywhere. It's pretty sweet. Other one is just tr trading cards. Uh, sorry, is doing the share intel. You can hand over any city card instead of the card matching the city where you are located. There's an overview of the prologue game from Pandemic Legacy Season 0, which I played twice on a review copy from Z-Man Games, both times with two players. First game we lost. It seemed like it was going to be a couple turns away to win, but many locations had three agents on them. If you run out of agents to put on the board, you lose the game. We actually lost because we had to put out an eighth incident. Uh, we weren't really close, even though it seemed close. Second game we won, had a much better handle on how to do things. Maybe the cards just fell right or the experience helped in terms of doing this. It takes a lot of cards to put a team out in play, but you really want teams out there. We did not do so much with the teams in the first game, and that's how we ended up with lots of locations with three agents on them, and it would take a long time to move somewhere in order to clear out agents. Lots of actions to do that, but if you leave a team somewhere, it just clears them all out at the end of a turn. And then, ideally, the next player is going to move it one space, or hopefully only one space, to an adjacent location, and move those, and keep moving them around the board, and taking out the agents sort of in the background while you're doing other things. Although, of course, that is taking up your 
actions in order to move those teams around. You have only 14 allied cards, 14 Soviet cards, so you can only put two teams from those affiliations on the board. You have three in the box, so clearly there's some trickery, trickery going on with the legacy element once you actually get into that. You do have 20 neutral cards, so you can put those on as well. You need those teams moving around in order to do things, not to mention, of course, achieving the objectives because you need the Soviet team definitely to go to Novosibirsk, and then you need a team of an unknown affiliation in order to get the Project Medusa sample in Europe. So you can kind of preemptively make a team of each affiliation, or you can start collecting the Europe cards and uncover that hidden city identity or you can just hope to reveal things over time. Uh, in the, the second game, we got down, we, there were only five cards left in the deck. Initially, we saw only two Europe cards through, I think, the first two thirds of the game. There just was almost nothing for Europe. So we spent a lot of time doing other things. And then eventually the Europe cards came up and we were able to reveal it. And then everything worked out after that. So it's a very different feel for how you're moving through things because you have the mix of revealing the hidden card. You need cards for that region where the, where the hidden card is from. So I had to get three Europe cards at a European safe house. For a team, you need five cards of that affiliation at a safe house located in a location from that affiliation. So there's sort of overlapping concepts there but not necessarily. It's a little hard just to get your head around it first. Probably ready to dive into the legacy game right now. I will just tease a little bit. When you complete an operation, so we got this here with the Project Medusa. If you complete it, you read a certain section from the debrief book. If you fail it, you read a different section from the debrief book, which all has paragraphs in it that are numbered and you flip through and you find the thing to read and you don't look at anything else. You can go back and reread anything that you've seen before so you can mark them in some manner so you know you can go back and see what you can read. Okay, there's one element. I've already showed some of the stickers. There are other stickers. You can put more surveillance on the board. There are certain skills you can have. There are liabilities that you can gain if your cover is blown to a certain degree try not to mess things up too, too much here. There are, like in Pandemic Legacy Season 1, things to punch out, new rules to discover, uh, who knows what else. There are additionally eight boxes in the box, eight small safe deposit boxes. You see I have actually hit one and three. Uh, I tried to pick up something from the box and I accidentally opened those one and three with my fingers. Now I have to not peek or I have to tape them up or something so I just don't see until the time is right. You have a legacy deck, like the legacy season one. You have the prologue cards on the top, which have the objectives. And now I stop before I get to January, which is going to have you initially set up the aliases and you'll get into the actual campaign. Uh, legacy deck two, which starts in July. You have an operations deck that is also sealed, not to be looked at. Uh, there are additionally some intelligence and personnel top secret folders where you might put stuff over the course of the game such as initially off the legacy deck you've got something in here and you build up information that will come into play in some manner over the course of the game i am excited to get to this when i finally can get the people together at the right time it's a bit unfortunate of course that we are living through an actual pandemic where it makes it hard to get together with the people who you want to play with. You have the anticipation of doing this. Hopefully you can get it together with your people. And instead of actually reliving the pandemic, you now get to relive the Cold War, which may or may not be better. I don't know. I can't speak to your situation. But it's an incredibly good setup here with this interesting deduction element added in on top of everything else. It's not just the logistics of moving around, managing the resources, clearing things out in the board, uh, keeping track of the probability of what cards get shuffled back on top of the deck when you do have the escalation come up and have more threats revealed, have an increased threat level of agents coming out. You have the in interesting use of the incidents on the uh, location cards. So you have different effects as those incidents come out and those cards come out of play for the game, at least for that game. 
and they get shuffled in later. Again, who knows what changes once you get into the legacy element down the road, but it's different elements that are coming into play in different ways. The deduction element is really neat, and I'm curious to see where we go with that, because I know once you get to May, you're going to have three objectives on the board. You carry through with those. When you finish the game, so when all ob objectives are either completed or failed, then the game is over. Or, of course, if you have an eighth incident, or you run out of agents, or you run out of the deck. If you complete all the objectives, great. You're gonna move on to the next month. You're gonna have your funding decrease, so you take an event card out of the deck. Yeah, you're doing a good job. If you fail only one objective, you can still move on to the next month, but your funding is gonna go up. You don't have to cycle through. If you fail two or more objectives, well, then you're gonna replay the month at least once, and you'll move on to the next month anyway, as in the original season one but when you replay the month the second time if you did complete an objective then you can keep that complete at the start of the month you did something and that will start completed and then you will move on from there and as you complete all the objectives you're going to or fail them you of course will read through the debriefing book you can keep track of what you're doing on the back of the debrief book there's a lot of stuff in this box there you go Overview of Pandemic Legacy Season 0. I hope you get to enjoy it with the people that you love.